Okay, rise and shine. I got to start all over again. No, I won't start all over again. Uh, no, we're asking this question, right? Like, is God still into this? Because it seems through, you know, culture and the change through culture, it seems through COVID, it seems through all kinds of different things that we, we're doing a lot of things really well. But one of the things that we're not really doing is this, um, is this emphasis, this uh, push into sharing our faith and letting our light shine and just being who God called us to be. And last week we read, you know, that Jesus is calling us to be salt, right? And if you want to just read a mind-blowing a uh, quote from Jesus in one of his sermons, uh, read Matthew 5, and I think it starts at chapter, or verse 13, and read through in the message. And we read it last week, I won't take time because we read it last week, or you can look it up on YouTube. But um, it's just fantastic, where Jesus is calling us to be salt, and calling us to be light. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like, let's just hunker in church and have cake and ice cream. It's safe. It's wonderful. It tastes good, you know? And then we get to go, go home and we all feel happy. But God hasn't called us just to kind of hold our uh, truth and the good news of the gospel to ourselves. It's not to be kept a secret. And that's what we talked about last week, that God is still moving in this way. And so this week, as we move into this, and we talked about anxiety and people are like, I hate going door to door. I hate telling my neighbor. I hate telling my coworker I'm a Christian. I don't want to let it out of the bag. And so all this kind of stuff. So people were kind of like a little bit tender. And I was like, you know what? Relax. The Spirit is going to lead us. The Spirit is going to empower us. The Spirit is going to do this work. It's not by might or power. It's by my Spirit, says the Lord. Amen? So just, just take a deep breath. We, we still have to talk about this. Just take a deep breath, and we're going we're gonna to move through it sequentially. And so today, what I wanted to talk about is I wanted to talk about the foundation. Before It's going to be super practical as we go into the next few weeks. I, I really feel like the practicality is going to really start to kind of come out and really be a strong part of this series. Last week was the blueprint. I believe this week is the foundation. This week is the foundation. This week, all the other weeks, will build on this week and last week. God is still wanting to touch the hearts and lives of people. In fact, I had a, co a coffee with a guy uh, on uh, Monday or Tuesday, I can't remember, and we were just chatting, and he actually just bought a motorcycle recently. Loving the whole biker life, and he's like, man, you gotta get one, and we gotta go for a ride, and all this stuff. And so, you know, this, this is my past. I love, I love motorcycles, I'd love to get one. And uh, anyways, he was telling me this story he, where they went out for this ride and it was for some charitable cause. And he meets this guy and he has this, you know, the leather jacket on with the Christian biker logo on the back. And so he, he's talking to this guy. And this guy's a little rough around the edges. And he's like, it's a Christian biker? And so this guy just says, you know what, yeah, you know what, I just gave my life to Jesus six months ago. I was hooked on drugs, I was on alcohol, I was into crime, I was actually part of another biker gang, and I had to get uh, kind of hazed out of the biker gang, and then I, I started with this other biker gang, with Jesus. And so now I'm following Jesus, and I'm riding my bike for Jesus. And he goes, you know what, I get up every day and I struggle with alcohol. I, I just want to drink alcohol all the time. And he goes, but the thing about this biker gang is that if you have the vest on, you're not allowed to drink alcohol. So he says, you know what I've done? Is I just keep the vest on all day long. And that stops me from drinking alcohol. And he says, like, I just found this new life. I didn't know this existed. This guy has been through the ringer. He's in his mid-30s, and he's coming to faith in Jesus. God is still saving people. God is still pulling people out of the muck and the mire of the world that is all around us. Amen. So we, we have to believe that. And then also, now as it pertains to us, there has to be this foundational uh, uh, work. If we're going to do anything for God, what is that going to be built on? What is that going to be built on? We're calling this series Rise and Shine. And God wants us all to shine in our own way, in our own world, as Jesus is just exposed um, uh, you know, in us and through us. And so today, as we talk about this by way of intro, I have a bit of a funny intro, and then it's going to get serious, serious later. So if you're going to laugh at any point in the, ser in the sermon, laugh now. Like, get all your laughs out right now. Uh, it's this whole idea of spray tan. And if you've done spray tan, like, God bless you. I, I don't mean any, my, my, I, I know some people who've done spray tan. Actually, I used to know a guy, a guy who used to attend our church, owned a spray tanning clinic. And some people would go into the spray tan. So no judgment about the spray tan. However, 
it is fake, right? And so some people are like, well, I'm going to go to Bermuda and I don't want to look like Casper the Friendly Ghost. You know, you know, for those of you who are of color, you guys don't even get this, but people like me, like if you saw my legs, man, you'd be like, put on some sunglasses, right? Because it's, it's a shame down here, I'll tell you that. So people kind of like, they want to just put on the spray tan to get ahead of the game, right? Or whatever. Or they want to look good for a wedding or whatever, right? You would have no trouble with it, right? You just kind of go to the sun for 10 minutes and you look okay. So anyways, the, the idea is it's kind of fake. And, and, you know, my dad, God bless him, was this guy who was like, I always, in the summer, he always wanted to look summery. I always want to look like I've been outside. And so what he would do is he would go at work, he would have his lunch outside every day in the summertime. And so he got a magnificent tan just at work because he ate his lunch outside. And he would sit in a certain way and you have the little, remember the little threefold thing that would kind of shine, all right? Reflect and he would just be like, okay, I'm golden. I'm looking good in the summer here. And uh, so, but he spent the time, he put the work in, but the spray tanning stuff, uh, it's kind of fake. And you know what? Sometimes it can go wrong too, right? Anybody ever seen these pictures about when the spray tanning goes wrong? I, I have I provided some for you for your pleasure. Here are a couple of spray tan pictures. <laughs> like no instruction about the goggles. It's like, yeah, you might want to just close your eyes or something. Maybe the goggles were a little too big for this lady and she has to walk around like this for the next couple of weeks. I love it. Uh, next one. Okay, so maybe press that button a few too many times. It's like, how many treatments did she get in the one? Uh, she looks, yeah, very, it's very stunning. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay. <laughs> like the one thing is, if you do this, you don't have to do dental work because the contrast between your teeth, right? You don't have to bother going to the dentist. But here's my thought. If we are called to be evangelistic with our faith, we can't be fake. If we're going to shine, it can't be a spray tan. You have to do the work. In order for you to be able to share Jesus, you got to know Jesus. Does that make sense? You got to know. Like Jesus has got to have done something in your life. And you got, like there's got to be some work put in. Kind of like my dad. My dad would go up and for every lunch hour during the summer, he would go out there and he would bake in the sun for 20 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever. And he would put the work in. And for Christians, if we are going to share our faith or be a part of any kind of outreach or do anything for God, then it has to be from a God well that's inside us that is filled to the brim. Does that make sense? Like, we don't want to be hypocrites. Right? Where it's like, okay, well, I'll give credence to the fact that we're supposed to evangelize. And I'll even invite people to church. But there's a bunch of stuff going on in my life that I probably should not be the one doing this. So my question to you for the foundation is, how's your faith? How's your faith? And this is not to be judgmental. This is to be inventorial. This is to be kind of like, yeah, where am I with God? Where am I with God? Because if I am going to move, I do believe God still wants to save souls. I do believe still God still wants to pull people out of drugs and alcohol and crime and all of those things. And if I'm going to be a part of that, well, then I need to be filled up on Jesus myself. It just, it just makes sense, doesn't it? Makes sense. So the question is, how is, your, how is your faith? And so as we're going through this, I just want you to be kind of just checking in with the Spirit. And just asking the Spirit, yeah, where am I on my faith journey? Uh, you know, am I, am I, am I, am I ready? Am I ready to be used of God or is there some work to do? And so I have a peculiar scripture and I, I apologize. Madeline's like, man, you have like 20 scripture slides today. And I'm like, I know. She's like, read them quick because we've got to get to cake. And I'm like, I know. But, uh, you know, I, I can't, I couldn't cut and paste this story. So we're going to go to a story, and don't go to it yet, Madeline. Uh, it's the story of Moses. And so as you know, the children of Israel were in Egypt for hundreds of years, and God delivered them miraculously. And then Moses was called to lead them out of Egypt. And to where? Okay, the promised land. Where's the promised land? I don't know. We'll have to figure it out. And so Moses has all of these people he's responsible for. There's no laws. There's no guidebook. There is no uh, YouTube tutorial on how to lead a million people through the desert. Like there's, right? He's just kind of flying blind. 
And so it's kind of like his task is kind of like our task where we have to lead other people to Jesus. He had this momentous task. And of course, we know how the first part of it, remember he went up on the mountain and he got the Ten Commandments from God and God used his finger and it was like this miraculous thing and he came down with these ten rules. We're going to live by these ten rules as we go forward. And when he came down, what did he find? He found all the Israelites were gathered around and they had melted down all their jewelry and all the jewelry that had been given them and they made this calf and they're worshiping, oh, great and mighty calf, you know, you brought us out of... It's like, no, it was, it was God that brought you away. This calf didn't even exist until 20 minutes ago. And he came down, he threw the tablets, broke the calf, and right then the rest is history. So he's kind of at a loss. He's like, God, I thought I did what you asked me to do. I thought I did what you wanted me to do. And how am I supposed to lead this through? What is the foundation going to be for Israel as we move forward? It's the question that we're asking. What is the foundation for us going to be as we move forward? And I think, I think they speak, like they spoke to Moses, they speak to us. And there's a twist at the end. So let's read from that point forward in Exodus 34. It says, then the Lord told Moses, chisel out. So now it's on Moses. God did it the first time. Moses is like, God's like, okay, you're going to do it this time. Chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones. I'll write on them the same words that were on the tablets that you smashed. <laughs> okay, no judgment either, Moses. Like, you're, you're good. We're okay with it. Uh, be ready in the morning to climb up Mount Sinai and present yourself to me on the top of the mountain. No one else may come with you. In fact, no one is to appear anywhere on the mountain. Do not even let the flocks and herds graze on or near the mountain. So it's this idea of solitude that... It's on Moses, and Moses is going to go by himself in this kind of isolated way, and he's going to meet God. He's going to stand before God on the top of this mountain. And he's so isolated that even the herds aren't supposed to be on this mountain. Let's go to the next one. It says, so Moses chiseled up the tablets of stone, like the first ones early in the morning, he climbed Mount Sinai. As the Lord had commanded him, he carried these two stone tablets. That would have been daunting, right? Two pieces of stone. you got to lug them up the mountain. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him, and he called out his own name, Yahweh. And the Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out. And so you see, Moses finally gets to the top. He's got the two stone tablets. He's chiseled it out. And then God appears. And isn't that what we all want? I mean, it's, it's kind of what we do want and what we dread. You know, all at the same time. It's like, dang, if God shows up, I'm going to be undone. I'm going to be in big trouble. God's going to show up. And so God shows up to Moses, which is what he wanted because he needs direction. He needs to know what the foundation is. So this is God speaking in his in first person. He says, Yahweh the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon the children and their grandchildren. The entire family is affected even children to the third and fourth generations. So God's like, okay, I'm very merciful, but there's also some judgment coming. There's also like an account that needs to be given for how you live, right? And I, I, gotta, I gotta warn you, we're already a little bit into this, but this is super Old Testament stuff. This is God speaking. So as you would, Moses immediately threw himself to the ground and worshiped. Like, if God came down and spoke to you like that, you would just be like, please don't kill me. And that's what Moses says. Please don't kill me. He says, oh, Lord, if it is true, I have found favor with you, then please travel with us. Yes, this is a stubborn and rebellious people, but please forgive our iniquity and our sins. He goes before the people for God. Claim us as your own special possession. So God's like, okay, I think we kind of get an understanding here. What's the foundation? And then God's going to lay down a whole bunch of rules. And you have to kind of translate them into 2022, and we'll do that in just a second. So the Lord replied, listen, I'm making a covenant with you in the presence of all your people, which of course they were down in the mountain. I will perform miracles that you have never, that have never been performed anywhere in all the earth or in any nation. So we know that to be true both before and after. And all the people around you will see the power of the Lord, the awesome power I will display for you. But listen carefully to everything I command you, and then I will go ahead of you and drive out the Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Which are all the people that were 
uh, inhabiting the land. So God's like, okay, I will go with you. So be, be careful. So now here comes a couple of the addendums to I'm going to do this for you. And now here's what you need to do. Here's the foundation. Be very careful never to make a treaty with the people who live in the land where you are going. If you do, you will follow their evil ways and be trapped. So if you translate that to the 21st century, I mean, what is it that the world is after that also the church is starting to go after as well? Right? And so God is saying, you, you need to be devout. You need to be mine. You need to be, there's this level of exclusivity that needs to happen if you're going to choose to follow me. Instead, you must break down their pagan altars, smash the sacred pillars, and cut down their Asherah poles, and you must worship no other gods, for the Lord, whose very name is Jealous, is a God who's jealous about the relationship with you. God's like, this is an exclusive relationship. It can't be, we're working one day, and then you're off with somebody else the next day. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. That's foundation number one. Let's go to the next one. You must not make a treaty of any kind with the people living in the land. They lust after their gods, offering sacrifices to them. They will invite you to join them in their sacrificial meals, and you will go with them. And then you will accept their daughters, and he's kind of talking hyperbolic here, but who sacrifice to their gods and wives for your sons, and they will seduce your sons and commit adultery against me by worshiping other gods. And you must not make up any gods of molten metal for yourselves, which they just had done. So he's like, I just want to be clear. I'm your God. I'm going to direct you. Let's go to the next one. You must celebrate the festival of unleavened bread, which now we know is Passover. And again, this was only 50 days from Passover, right? Which is crazy to think about that, but he would have remembered it so vividly. For seven days, the bread you eat must be without yeast. Uh, just as I commanded you, celebrate the festival annually in the appointed time in early spring in the month of Abib. For that is the anniversary of your departure from Egypt. And so these are those high water marks with God. Right? Let's go on to the next one. And it says, The firstborn of every animal belongs to me, including the firstborn of males, from your herds of your cattle and flocks and sheep and goats. Firstborn donkey may be brought back by the Lord, presenting a lamb or young goat in its place. But if you do not buy it back, you must break its neck. However, you must not break... You must not... Buy Buy back every firstborn son. So, again, here's the deal, right? So we're going to talk about this in just a second. But God has given us everything, including the air you're breathing right now, the heart that's beating inside your chest, the brain that is functioning and processing all this information. God gave that to you. You did nothing to put that together. And so God is asking, as you live in me and you're devout to me, then what I want you to do is offer back to me the work of your hands. And that's what God is saying here. This is the idea of the tithe. It's really in its early form. So no one may appear before me without an offering. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, uh, work, but on the seventh day you must stop working even during the seasons of plowing and harvest. And then he talked about Passover before. Now he's talking about celebrating the festival of harvest uh, with the first crop of the wheat harvest and to celebrate the festival of the final harvest at the end of the harvest season. I'm going to bring this all around because some of you guys are going, okay, we're getting lost in Old Testament lingo. Just stay with it, and I'm going to bring it around in a second. Three times each year, every man must uh, in Israel must appear before the sovereign Lord, the God of Israel. Talk about church attendance, right? You know, we got a bad, right? We got to come every week. They had to only go three times a year. How, you know, how did they get off? Anyways, uh, I will drive out the other nations ahead of you and expand your territory so no one will covet and conquer your land while you appear before the Lord uh, three times each year. So God's saying, I'm going to protect you. While you come to church, I'm going to make sure that everything is, is, is signed, sealed, delivered, and protected. You must not offer blood. The blood of my sacrificial offerings together with any baked goods containing yeast and none of the meat of the Passover sacrifice uh, may be kept over until the next morning. As you harvest your crops, bring the very best of the harvest to the house of the Lord your God, and you must not cook a young uh, cook a young goat in its mother's milk. Continue on. So that's just a uh, you know just a big uh, cooking tip there. Uh, then the Lord said to Moses, "Write down all these instructions, for they represent the terms of the covenant I'm making with Israel." Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So you might all of this. It's a lot of Old Testament garbly goop, which. May or may not hit you, and you're like, oh, why that? And why that? that doesn't make sense. And man, God seems pretty angry in this. And he, right? And so you just kind of like got all these questions. Just hold those, hold those loosely. 
Because what happened for Moses back then is different from what's happening for us right now. But the idea of the foundation and the expectations are the same. And we're going we're gonna to come to that. So just hold them loosely in a second, and you're going to see what actually happens. So just check out this, and then get ready for the twist ending. Moses remained there on the mountain for, with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. Dead. Imagine you can be in the presence of the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. In all that time, he ate no bread and drank no water. And the Lord wrote the terms of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, on the stone tablets. Now watch what happens. When Moses came down Mount Sinai carrying the two stone tablets, inscribed with the terms of the covenant, he wasn't aware that his face had become radiant because he had spoken to the Lord. So when Aaron and the people of Israel saw the radiance in Moses' face, they were afraid to come near him. It's like, bro, you are, have you been to Chernobyl? Because you are glowing. Right? You are glowing. But this was no fake tan. This was like, I was 40 days and 40 nights face to face with Almighty God. And he was lowering the boom. Do this. Don't do that. Make sure you do. It's like this, you know, ultimate father to son talk. And he's like, I am with you. And you have to follow my ways. And if you do, you're going to succeed. But if you don't, you're going to mess up. And so Moses was just taking this all in and just spending all this intimate time with God. And when he came down, he was shining. He was glowing. Moses called out to them and asked Aaron and all the leaders of the community to come over. And he talked with them. And all the people of Israel approached him. And Moses gave them all the instructions the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses finished speaking with them, he covered his face with a veil. This is significant, right? Because number one, it's kind of protecting them. They didn't have to see Moses' glowing face. But it also is a fulfillment in scripture later on. Whenever he went into the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, he would remove the veil until he came out again, and then he would give the people whatever instructions the Lord had given him. And the people of Israel would see the radiant glow of his face, so he would put the veil over his face until he returned to speak with the Lord. Like, just kind of crazy stuff, right? Like, and I appreciate your indulgence. I just read a full chapter of the Bible. And so I know that that's the worst form of communication, right? I just, I know it from a communication standpoint. However, the power that is in there, if you can grab it, is, is profound. When we live up to the way God wants us to live, and when we spend time in his presence, all of a sudden our lives begin to change. Can anybody attest to that? Right? Our lives begin to take on a whole different form. And people kind of look at us like this biker and they go, hey, something, what's going on with you? Right? What's going on with you? And you're living in the way that God wants you to live, and there's a difference made. And I love what Paul wrote in Corinthians, and there's a whole chapter again in Corinthians. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but there's a little bit more in Corinthians. And this is Paul going, hey, remember Moses? Remember when his face was shining brightly? Remember the law that God gave him? Remember about don't boil a, a mother in its, uh, or don't boil a goat, a baby goat in its mother's milk? Remember all those laws that God had? Oh, don't talk to those people and burn down those poles and all that stuff. Well, they don't exist anymore. But what we have, isn't it more significant? Isn't it better? And so that's the veil. Moses was shining. And there was this glory of the gospel of Jesus. And it's like, yeah, that's the Old Testament. And it's veiled until Jesus comes and drops the veil. And now you have what God intended for us to have all along. The old way, with the laws etched in stone, led to death. Though it began with such, a, with such glory that the people of Israel could not even bear to look at Moses' face. Remember, this is like thousands of years later. And this is what, Paul, or this is what the Apostle Paul is writing to the people in the Corinthians. For his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading away. Shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way? Now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? Wow, I never thought of that before. Like Moses had to go up on Sinai with two tablets. We can come to an altar and just experience the presence of God. Man. 
Let's go to the next one. It says, if the old way which brings condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way which makes us right with God? In fact, that first glory was not glorious at all compared to the overwhelming glory of the new way, which is Jesus. So if the old way which has been replaced was glorious, how much more glorious is the new which remains forever? And I think there's one more slide. It says, since the new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. We're not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see his glory, even though it was destined to fade away. But the people's minds were hardened, and to this day the old covenant is still being read, and the same veil covers their minds so they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Jesus. Okay? Appreciate your indulgence. It's kind of some heavy stuff. But the result is this, that Moses needed some guidance. He needed a foundation to work with to kind of do what God was calling. We also need a foundation to do what God... We can't just kind of go, oh, okay, well, let's just have a, an outreach. Well, we could do that, but I don't think that's the way God wants us to do it. I think God wants to go, hey, wait a second, how are you and I doing? Are we good first before you go telling everybody with your spray tan that Jesus is the way? Are you with me? Like, this is a check in me. And I'm kind of like, okay, you, you got a nice little spray tan there, boy, and now you're going to tell everybody how to get, how to get a tan? How, how long is that going to last? So here's, I got seven things. Seven things. Quickly. Then the cake. Then the cake. Seven things that were in this scripture that we'll put in 2022 terms as a foundation for us to go forward into this idea of rising and shining. Number one. This is the first thing Moses did when God came down and spoke to him was repentance. 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 All, and I'm going to tell you as well, all these words are not politically correct. All of them. Well, most of them. Uh, repentance. This means there's sin. There's things that we do that offend God. And how dare we go to the community and say Jesus is the way if we've got sin in our lives. Anybody with me? I know that's hard to say. But that's the truth. And I think that's what God was saying to Moses. And then Moses was like, I'm going to fall down flat on my face. Please don't kill us all. Use us all. Let us be your special possessions. Repentance. And the beauty of this is that God is so forgiving that all you have to say, say is, God, I am so sorry. And like this biker, I'm going to throw the biker vest on me and I'm going to, while I have this vest on, I can't drink alcohol, so I'm going to, I'm going to do that. I'm going to repent of my sin. Because I want to be used of you. It's a foundational thing. Number two, again, not politically correct, is obedience. Obedience. Obedience to the law of the Lord. They didn't have a law, so this kind of feels a little different in its tone than what we're used to. Verse 10 said, Then the Lord said, I'm making a covenant with you before all your people. I will do wonders uh, never before done in any nation of the world. The people who live among you will see how awesome the Lord is. Uh, but you must obey what I command you today. As somebody once quipped, they're not the ten suggestions, they're the ten commandments. Right? There's a law of God that we need to live by. And when we do, we prosper. We don't like it. It's like eating liver and Brussels sprouts. Unless you like liver and Brussels sprouts and then it's something else. I don't like liver and Brussels sprouts. And I'm like, the law of God sometimes feels, it's just, I don't like it. I want to live my own way. And God's like, yeah, that's the whole point. I created you like that. You have that bend in you. And when you do that, you end up in a mess. So live my way. Be obedient. Not politically correct at all. The third one is intimacy and solitude. And I think this speaks more to our culture than probably it did to Moses. The Bible says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. The problem is for us is that we're up and we're out the door and we got the radio on and then we this and then we work and then we and then we finish and then we all oh, and then we, we get home, we got to okay, with the laundry and then not and then fall into bed and then hit repeat. And God's like, Do you want me to work with you or not? At some point along the way, there has to be this moment where we connect. And if we don't connect, then what do you have to offer the world? All you have to offer the world is exactly the same thing that they're doing. 
intimacy and solitude. Number four, again, pretty politically incorrect is exclusivity. Do not worship any other God for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. Do not make other idols. Do not do this. Do not do this. Do not go. I'm enough is what God is saying. And you know what I thought was this funny? We would all love to live in an exclusive neighborhood. You know? I was like, oh, where, where do I live? Oh, well, like for us, it's the Westlake Estates and these, you know, couple million dollar homes and they're just beautiful manicured lawns and 5,000 square feet and home gyms and home theaters and pools in the backyard. And it's like, okay, <laughs> I want to be exclusive in my neighborhood. But when it comes to God, it's like, well, no, no, hold on a second. I don't know if I want to be so exclusive with the things of God. Maybe I want to take a little of this, take a little of that. God's like, no, if you're going to follow me, I'm enough. You don't need anything else. It's super not politically correct, but that's the way God rolls. And if we're going into a conversation to convince somebody that they need God in their life, we can't be wavering. Go, well, you could use a little bit of this, or you could use a little bit of this. Exclusivity. Number five is attendance. And I love this, that God's like, okay, right in the rules. There wasn't even a church yet. He's going, yeah, everybody needs to attend church three times a year. And there was a whole bunch of festivals and things that God was expecting. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention this in the practicality that you just coming to church is evangelistic. Because when you're at church and somebody comes through these doors and goes, oh, there's somebody just like me. Okay, maybe, wait a second, maybe there's something here, right? And so you just coming to church, not even saying a word, just your presence coming to church is strengthening somebody else. Number, number six is giving. We talked about this a little bit. Telltale sign of your devotion to the Lord is when you're willing to take 10% of what you earn and you're willing to give it to God and go, God, this is, I'm giving this back to you as a sign of worship. I'm giving this back to you for you to do what you want because you gave me 100% of everything I got. It's all yours anyways. Give back to the Lord. And I mean, he went through a whole bunch of different stuff. And then the last one is waiting. The last one is waiting. And Moses fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And we're not going to do that, by the way. It's like, okay, is Pastor Rob going to... Well, after the cake, it's 40 days and 40 nights. No, I'm just... Uh, it, it, the, the idea here is just devotion to God. And, and could you give up some internet time? Could you give up some uh, social media time? Could you give up some YouTube time? Could you give up some TV time? Or could you give up any one of those things just for five minutes with God? That would change your life. And when it changed your life, it might change somebody else's life. Moses went up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. You don't think there was some anxiety? The last time I came down after being up on this mountain, they built a golden calf. Like it was a gong show. They're dancing around. Hey, this calf, we're celebrating this calf. I'm like, are you guys morons? Like it's, you just made this. Right? But that's what we do, right? We spend all this time and no time waiting on God. See, this is what I've kind of come to learn even as preparing this message, that the goal for us is not really evangelism at all, is it? It's intimacy with Jesus. And when we go through these things, when we, go, when we repent, when we're obedient, when we have intimacy and solitude, exclusivity, attendance, and giving, and waiting on God, and praying and fasting, all of a sudden, God just starts to shine out of us. It just, it's just a natural byproduct. All of a sudden, we walk around, and people are like, you're different. How come you're not doing this? Well, just, I just want to be closer to God. That's all. People are like, well, tell me more about that, because I don't even know anything about this God stuff. Shine for God. Shine for God. And I can't help but think, because I know in the context that we're reading it, that the Israelites, they spent 40 years in the wilderness. First, God had to kind of get their attention. But then they went in and they dominated the promised land. And to this day, they are in the promised land. So when God said, I'm going to do things with you that there's never happened before in any other nation, he was not whistling Dixie because literally those prophecies have come true. Even though the world has been set to take these guys out, they're still there. They're still there. 
Even without church buildings in many places where they existed, their faith remained strong because their community remained strong. And I can't help but imagine what it would be like if, you know, we all just shone that little bit brighter. Because I have to be honest, a, a lot of you, when I look at you, you're already shining for Jesus. You're already shining for God. When I see some of the way you guys love God and serve God and live for God, I'm like, they're already shining. You know, yesterday we had this sales guy in our, in our house and, and, uh, and, you know, we chit chat and we're doing the kind of had this little sales thing going on and, you know, we're just, you know, you, you, the little bit of a connection, right? And then all of a sudden we're going through the process and I'm giving some information. And I had to give my email address, pastor.robsharp at, email, at gmail.com. And he's like, oh, you're a pastor, right? He's like, wow, we attend the church up on a, I knew it, I knew it. I was looking, I was looking at some of your books and I was reading and all of a sudden it, like the whole thing just changed. And I was like, there's just that inkling and you just see somebody, you're just like, I know there's something different. And I know that in this room, Man, there's, like when you guys are walking the streets, when you guys are at work, when you guys are at the bank, when you guys, and you're just shining for Jesus, man, I know that there's a witness there. When you're, right, you're doing your thing, and I think God's going, yeah, but give me a little bit of time. Give me a little bit of all these things that we mentioned, and then watch what I'll do. Can you imagine if we all did that? Our community would be changed, wouldn't it? But this, this is the foundation. We got to get our foundation right. We got to make sure that we're we're right with God. So it's it's time for you to take stock and just say, okay, of these seven things, where is it that I need to? Where do I need to dial in? Like, and just remember, I know it may feel like I'm talking about liver and onions, but this is a relationship with Almighty God. Like when, no duh, when Moses was like, yeah, 40 days and 40 nights. But God, can I just stay here? Can't we just invite Israel to come up? I'm like, we'll just make some houses up here and we'll just hang out with you. No, 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 that's later. God's got a job for us to do. But it has to start here first. And all of us. It has to start here first. So let me pray over you, speak over you, what we've already sung. And then we will go and have some fellowship. Let's stand together. And I'm going to pray this priestly prayer over you as we've already sung it. And I just want you to receive this. And as we go forward from this place, that we would rise and shine for God. And the prayer is, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. And Father, we just thank you for...